Welcome to The Mushroom Show, the one place that you need to be if you want to stay on top of all the cool things happening in the world of mushrooms. And wow, we just crossed 360,000 subscribers on this channel. I know I say this every time, but my friends and fungi, I really do appreciate every single one of you. I really feel like we're building a special community here with the power of mushrooms and I couldn't be more excited about it. In this episode of The Mushroom Show, we're going to be looking at some folks who are secretly sowing spores using super soakers. We're also going to be looking into the down fall of Synthesis Institute, which was a key part of Oregon's recent legalization movement of psilocybin. Plus, we have a very shroom-focused interview with the founder of Psychedelics Today, Kyle Buller. So before we get started, if you like mushrooms, if you like The Mushroom Show, please go ahead and hit that like button. It really helps the show get out to more people. And consider subscribing as well if you want to see future episodes. Let's jump into the show. Here's an experiment in a high-tech psilocybin patch-making technology. I got some spore prints here. I got some water. I got some of these new Spira squirt guns, these Spira 2 electric squirt guns. Check this out. I'm rubbing the spore prints off in the water to make spore water. And then like Halo, I'm gonna walk around and shoot some spores all over the place. Here, get a charge shot in there. I want a big patch over there. More patches. Oh, I hope this works, this is too much fun. Okay, so I saw this article in Vice and it's titled The People Secretly Growing Magic Mushrooms in the Wild. Gorilla gardeners are using squirt guns and spore-infused water to spread fungi in the forests. And the basic idea here, like you saw in the video, is that you can essentially grow mushrooms in the wild by taking spore prints and then putting them in a solution of water, mixing it all around, soaking it up with a super soaker and just kind of blasting it all over the forest into areas where they're likely to naturally be able to grow. You could then return later in the year or in subsequent years and hopefully run into a fruit patch of mushrooms that you essentially cultivated. And maybe the first thing that you're wondering is, would this actually work? And the answer is kind of yes, actually. This is kind of how mushrooms naturally grow. I mean, mushrooms will spread their spores in the wind, which will hopefully land in areas where they're able to grow, and then they will sporulate and grow the mycelium and do the whole thing and eventually fruit. So this process is basically just kind of expediting the whole thing and kind of helping nature along by blasting the spores all over the forest, in this case with a super soaker instead of just with the wind. And usually when people cultivate mushrooms, well, there's like a million different ways that you could cultivate mushrooms, but typically it's a very sterile process. So if you started with something like a liquid spore syringe, usually that's completely sterile and then that would get injected into a sterilized piece of substrate, eventually the mycelium will take over and it will fruit. The main difference here is not only the scale, but it's also the sterility. Because when you're growing mushrooms indoors in controlled conditions, there is a major risk of contamination if everything is not perfectly sterile. Because you're not only creating the right environment for mushrooms to grow from spore, you're also creating the right environment for other competing fungi or other bacteria to also grow very well. So a lot of times people cultivating mushrooms at home, that's where they'll fail. They just don't have things sterile enough and it will contaminate. But when you're growing mushrooms out in the wild like this, yes, the success rate is potentially a lot smaller, but the risk of contamination is really not there. Either the mushrooms will grow or they won't. And whenever I see things like this, I always think like, who's really in control here, right? Is it us or is it the mushrooms? Because the mushrooms, which are another species, have somehow convinced humans to help them propagate their species. But instead, maybe let's think of it as kind of a win-win, right? The mushrooms want to grow, humans want to grow the mushrooms, so really this guerrilla gardening is more just kind of like teamwork. That being said, this is probably in some sort of legal gray area, right? Because for the most part, like, spores aren't illegal. I think unless you're in the states of California, Idaho, or Georgia, where it isn't legal to have spore prints or spore syringes, but anywhere else in any other state, it is legal depending on how it is used, which is why when you can buy spore prints or spore syringes, and it always kind of comes with this cheeky warning like for microscopy use only, uh, but it's my guess that there's probably a lot more spore prints being sold than microscopes, but I don't know, maybe that's just a wild guess. 
But of course, it's not only psilocybin containing species that could be propagated using this method. A lot of people like to do this to help to propagate mushrooms that can't really be cultivated, such as morels or porcinis. I've seen people doing it as well with like oysters. And it's a very similar process where people will take fruiting bodies of the mushrooms. So for example, you take a fruiting body of a morel mushroom and you put it in a bucket of water and you kind of stir it around and you'd make this kind of like spore slurry and then they can spread this spore slurry over wood chips or over you know other areas where the mushrooms might easily grow and then come back later in the year or come back next year and hopefully there's a nice fruiting of morels or porcinis or oysters or whatever it is that you want. I've even seen spore infused chainsaw oil. So I think in Paul Stamet's book, Mycelium Running, they talk about like using chainsaw oil that has spores in it. So then when you're cutting down trees or cutting logs or whatever, you're also inoculating those same logs. Again, I don't know how successful this method is, obviously a lot less successful than just growing mushrooms in a normal way of cultivating them, but you know, still might be worth doing if you want to help propagate a certain species. But back to the psilocybin spores in these uh, super soakers, you know, is this considered cultivation or is this considered outside of microscopic use only or microscopy use only? Well, is it really cultivation? I don't know, it's hard to say, but it seems like, um, you know, Jeff and others that are doing this aren't really too worried about it anyways. Jeff says, the last few years, I've seen a significant decline in the population of magic mushrooms in our area. And so the only way to combat this is to plant more. Now, this is kind of an interesting question, right? Like, is there any sustainability concerns with mushrooms or people going out into the woods and picking all of the mushrooms and like Jeff is saying, I've seen a significant decline in the population of these species in their area. And it's hard to say for sure. I mean, maybe in very specific areas with very specific species, there could be some sustainability concerns. But if you look across the landscape of psychedelic plants and fungi, it's hard to imagine something more sustainable than mushrooms, right? They often grow in disturbed areas. They grow all over North America and the world. They grow on cow poop. They grow in wood chips. They grow on landscaping. They grow in urban areas and in like natural untouched areas and they are fast to cultivate as well. It's not like you can't easily cultivate mushrooms on a small scale or even a large scale if you wanted to. So if you compare that to something like the you know peyote cactus, which only grows in a very specific area and is super slow growing, or you compare it to say something like the Bufo alvarius frog, right? Which again, only exists in a small area and has the real potential of going extinct. Or even something like ayahuasca, which you know might be at potential risk from the destru destruction of its habitat in the jungle. So it's hard to imagine something better set up than mushrooms to be able to deal with a large increase in demand, which is something that is is likely to happen over the next few years. So maybe there are certain patches that do get over harvested, kind of like Jeff is mentioning here in this article, but in general, on the whole, I don't think there are any real sustainability issues with psilocybin containing mushrooms. The article goes on to talk about Peter McCoy who wrote a book called Radical Mycology, but also started something called the Spore Liberation Front, which was a call to help sporulate all types of mushrooms far and wide. Here talking about psilocybin containing mushrooms, he says, they're very aggressive, very easy to grow outdoors. He says of azorescence and cyanescence, two particularly potent hallucinogenic strains native to his hometown state of Oregon. So here he's talking about psilocybe azorescence, which we actually talked about in the last mushroom show, but also paniolus cyanescence. And these are species that aren't typically cultivated. So anytime you see, not anytime, but basically anytime you see cultivated magic mushrooms, it is Psilocybe cubensis. It takes up so much of the chatter when it comes to growing mushrooms, but there are lots of other species. There's dozens of other species that typically grow in the wild, in wood chips, just kind of all over the place. And they're typically harvested in urban areas which is what he's talking about here. So it is kind of interesting to see species which are not typically cultivated to be kind of quasi cultivated in this fashion. It also adds here, note to any would-be gardeners, spreading non-native species is a bad idea. That's kind of an interesting point and not just for psilocybin containing mushrooms, but there has been a lot of people recently saying that certain species, specifically like yellow oyster and shiitake, might even be considered a invasive species in North America because there's been such a boom of small scale farms all over the place that are starting to grow 
these mushrooms that don't naturally grow in that area and they've kind of escaped the farm and are now able to grow in the wild totally unchecked because, well, they're not native to that area. Of course, I'm always up for more mushrooms everywhere, but it's not hard to imagine that potentially a non-native species proliferating like crazy in a place where it's not normally supposed to be could have some unintended consequences. So it's definitely something worth thinking about. But the other thing that is mentioned in this article is this idea that if you grow mushrooms in the wild like this, they are essentially free. And I think it's kind of a bit of a protest against this kind of corporate encroachment into the world of mushrooms, which is an interesting way to think about it. Because yeah, mushrooms do just grow naturally in cow poop and on hillsides and in wood chip beds. So, you know, it's kind of hard to keep a lid on it. The article goes on to say, we're entering a whole new era of human fungal relationships. What we know today about fungal ecology, how they interact with the environment, married to our ability to cultivate them with ease, has never been available to humans in history. And I do kind of agree with that, even though people were growing shiitake, you know, 800 years ago by chopping down trees, soaking them and smacking them, and basically just trying to accelerate the process. Humans have been at this for a while, and it only seems like we're developing a deeper relationship with mushrooms, New technologies are being developed all the time to grow mushrooms at scale, such as using the Spira electric squirt gun. But mushrooms are still a mystery for the most part, which makes it really exciting to be involved and really exciting to be able to spread the spores. Whether you're growing oyster mushrooms in a bucket or you're just learning about mushrooms or you're soaking up, you know, spore water and squirt guns and blasting it all over the forest, it's still pretty cool to be able to contribute to mushrooms and learn from them as well. One last note on this, speaking of fungal ecology, I had my friend Jasper from Fungi Academy reach out to me over the weekend and he let me know that they are launching a brand new course called Fungal Ecology and wanted to see if I could let the community know about it. So it's a nine week program which starts on March 23rd and this is not an ad, not an affiliate relationship or anything like that. And I'm not taking the course yet, so I don't know, but I can tell you that Fungi Academy are doing some very cool things. They're just a great educator and voice in the space and it's definitely worth checking out if you want to learn more. Again, the course is called Fungal Ecology. It's by Fungi Academy, it launches March 23rd, so feel free to check it out. On to our next story. Now, this is something that has been all over my feed for the last little while, and it's about the recent closure of Synthesis Institute, which was a key player in the Oregon psilocybin movement. And this isn't the only psychedelic adjacent company that has found itself in financial peril recently. For example, Field Trip Health, which is a company that aims to build out a network of treatment centers, especially for ketamine, but likely also for other psychedelics, including psilocybin, announced that it is shutting down a number of its clinics in an effort to reduce expenditures and preserve capital. Of course, in 2020 and 2021, a huge amount of capital flowed into these psychedelic companies, and a lot of that seems to be crashing down right now. The question is, what effect will this have for the burgeoning business of psychedelics, but also for the legalization movement? And that, I think, is the real story here, because not only is there so much happening in the space, but the things that are happening now are going to have ripple effects into the future as this new paradigm of legal psilocybin or regulated psilocybin comes to life. Life. Specifically for Synthesis Institute, which you'll see when we get into it, was a very formative force in the space, not only for how psilocybin was to be regulated in Oregon, but also how facilitators are being trained and licensed. So I want to talk a little bit about what happened here, but also just in general, what it even means to have trained facilitators in the first place. So first, let's paint the picture here with a little bit of background. And if you really want to get a fulsome account of what happened here, there's two great articles, which I'll put the links in the description. But the first one is is Synthesis and the Shadow of Psychedelic Capitalism by Jules Evans. This really goes into the history of Synthesis, kind of how it came to be, and basically tells the whole story of everything that went on there. Again, I don't know how biased this kind of reporting is, but it seems like a really fulsome account of the whole history and kind of where it ended up today. And then if you want to get a good story of kind of the business side of things, there's this article here called Inside Synthesis Institute's Implosion by Josh Hardman. Again, this one really goes into a lot of detail in terms of what actually happened and what might have started the downfall, as they call it, of synthesis. But in short, here is the TLDR. So Synthesis Institute, which originally operated in the Netherlands conducting psilocybin retreats using psilocybin truffles, decided to expand into Oregon to capitalize on the state's psilocybin legalization and the growing interest in 
in psychedelic therapies there. One of their initial moves in Oregon was purchasing this place called Buckhorn Springs, which was a, I think, 120 some acre multi-million dollar property intending to be used for psilocybin retreats as well as a hub for their operations and training programs. They also established an online training program for aspiring psilocybin therapists charging $10,000 or more for the course, which aimed to equip participants with the skills and knowledge that were needed to facilitate psychedelic assisted therapy. Unfortunately though, due to zoning issues of all things, they weren't actually able to use their Buckhorn Springs property for retreats. Obviously this was unforeseen or else they wouldn't have probably bought the property, but this significantly impacted their plans and of course their financial projections. Now despite having over 200 aspiring therapists that were already enrolled in their online course, they were unable to sell as many as they had anticipated. And that coupled with mounting liabilities, financial issues, apparently some internal management struggles, and the inability to utilize this property as intended, the Synthesis Institute started to face some pretty serious financial challenges. Now, ultimately they ran out of funds and had to cease operations in early March of 2023, leaving a lot of students who had invested time and money in their training program that were in limbo, and also kind of raising questions about the future of psilocybin therapy training, but also the implications that this might have on the broader legalization movement. Now, this whole story brings up a few broader questions for me. Like, first of all, what does it even mean to be a licensed facilitator? And how do we determine and what qualifies someone to do that. There is a great paragraph in this Substack article that kind of brings up the absurdity of this question. It says, the Oregon Health Authority used synthesis course as a template for its psychedelic therapy program. Graduates would just need to take another theoretical exam and then they could be employed by a psilocybin service center. And the Oregon bill presented itself as a response to the public health crisis of mental illness. So someone without any experience in a healing profession who has done a year long online course course and then taken part in a truffle ceremony could be in a position to offer psychedelic therapy to the mentally ill. Now, to be fair, I do think that is exaggerating a little bit, especially the, you know, providing services to the mentally ill part, because there's like a broad spectrum of people that are going to be using these services or that intend to use these services. But still, it seems like perhaps the whole thing is just a little bit unnecessarily complicated. I mean, I totally get it that a lot of this is new and Oregon was the first out of the gate, so it's definitely not going to be perfect. But the way it was setup does kind of make you think about the feasibility of it all and you know if the way it's set up is actually going to work but it also makes you think a little bit about the potential conflicts of interest if the entities that are structuring the program and potentially influencing the laws are the same ones that are going to be running the retreats and training the facilitators there even with the best intentions it's not hard to imagine how there could be a potential conflict at the end of the day this is all very new so we should totally expect some turbulence and hopefully this is just part of a kind of bumpy transition i did also see this linkedin post from a professor of law in Florida who brought up a good point in terms of the potential impact that this could have. He says in reference to the Synthesis Institute's collapse, the collapse of its service center and training program could eliminate hundreds of thousands of dollars in annual license fees. The Oregon Health Authority needs those funds to operate the state's psilocybin program, which is already out of money, prompting the OHA to ask taxpayers for 6.6 .6 million to keep the program alive for one year. This is very bad news for impact employees, facilitator trainees, and the industry as a whole. If the state won't continue chipping in, the entire program could crumble. And that maybe seems a little bit hyperbolic, but who knows, right? This thing is really in its infancy, and that's when things are the most fragile. So again, hopefully this is just a bump in the road. Now, I should also note that since the publication of the original article, a company called Retreat Guru has taken over the training program from Synthesis and has offered a couple options for students who have paid to actually finish the program. Although it does seem from scanning social media that a lot of these students really just want a refund. Again, there is a lot of complexity here and it does seem to be a bit of a fluid situation, lots of moving pieces. But again, if you want to dive a little bit deeper, I highly recommend reading both of those articles. I will put the link in the description. Now, I did originally bring Kyle Buller onto the show to talk about the synthesis story a little more and dig into it. 
He is the co-founder of Psychedelics Today, but also a therapist and the vice president of training and education at Psychedelics Today. So I thought he would be able to offer some great insights, which he definitely did, but we ended up having a much broader conversation. We talked about his background and interest in psilocybin. We talked about the current state of psilocybin in the US and some of the major changes that are happening right now. We also talked about what it even means to be trained in this or what it even means to be a facilitator and some of the implications in both a historical and a modern context. It's a really great conversation. I think you're going to enjoy it. So let's jump in. So Kyle, thank you so much for joining us today on The Mushroom Show. Thanks for having me, Tony. Excited to be here. Yeah, uh, you're definitely familiar with podcasts. Um, you guys are, you know, you're doing Psychedelics Today, which is just an awesome podcast. But really quickly, I'd like you just to introduce yourself to the audience. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about what you do at Psychedelics Today. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so my name is Kyle Buller. I'm one of the co-founders at Psychedelics Today. Um, Joe Moore and myself uh, co-founded co -founded Psychedelics Today in 2016. Um, and we're really a media and education company in, in the psychedelic space. So we have our podcast that we've been doing for yeah almost seven years coming up in, in May. Um, so I think we have you know, a little over 500 or so episodes. <clears throat> and then um, what I do at the company is I really kind of uh, manage the education side of things. Um, so I guess my official title is like VP of uh, training and education um, and managing. Um, we just launched a year long uh, training program, education program uh, last year. So we're coming to the end of that. And that program is called Vital. Um, so I've been pretty much my head down and actually haven't been podcasting as much as I, I used to because I've just been uh, head down in this educational uh, experience, which has been fun. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, you guys are doing some great stuff and you've been doing it for a while as well. Uh, 2016 feels like a very long time ago in the, yeah. in the psychedelic space. It's a different era. Yeah, it was totally different. <laughs> yeah, very different. But I guess, so how did you become interested in this? And I guess specifically, like, how did you become interested in education or clinical education, psychedelic therapy, psilocybin assisted therapy? Where did that come from? Yeah, I'll try to keep it on the short end, but um, I'll, I'll just do some riffing here. So... <clears throat> Um, I've always really kind of been interested in consciousness. Even as a kid, I was just really interested in dreams. And then um, I came across this book when I was uh, 15 called Snowboarding to Nirvana. It was about this guy, uh, American, went over to M Nepal, was snowboarding, ran into a monk, taught him transcendental meditation. So that really kind of turned me on to meditation practices. And then a year later, I kind of just make a joke, I snowboarded to Nirvana. I got in a really bad snowboarding accident. Um, I ended up rupturing my spleen. Um, I almost died from massive internal bleeding. The doctor said if I came in five or 10 minutes later, I would have been uh, pronounced dead on arrival because I lost about five to five and a half, half pints of blood. Um, and so I was laying in the CAT scan machine and they're telling me not to fall asleep. And the kind of like a voice came over me and said, uh, you're going home. You're going back to the stars where we all come from. And this physical life's going to cease to exist, but you'll continue on. And the more that you struggle with this experience, the harder it's going to be. This is just a transition, relax into it. And I just became really blissed out and thinking, I'm going home, I'm going home. And the doctors are just like yelling at me, not yelling, but they're like, you know, talking over the intercom saying, don't fall asleep, Kyle, don't fall asleep, like stay with us. Um, and I just was really kind of drifting away. So after that experience, I came back and I rode a high for a few months, um, like just being so thankful that I was alive and I was able to, you know, wake up from that. And but then, you know, the the low started to hit um, and I really kind of fell into a huge existential kind of crisis. 16, right? We're all trying to find our personality, figure out who we are in the world. Um, I'm coming back and, you know, most of my friends are worried about teenage things and teenage problems. And I'm just comp contemplating like, what the hell? hell are we doing here? You know? Um, and I really didn't have any mentors or anybody. So it felt like really lonely at times of just trying to figure out like what happened. So then when I was 19, um, a friend of mine went out into the woods, had some psilocybin. I think I ate around like two grams and, uh, I, and I had a small experience before this, but I would say this is like really my first psilocybin experience. The other one was a little bit lower doses and, you know, it was fun, but I mean, nothing would have prepared me for this. Um, so yeah, I went out into the woods um, and really didn't know what I was getting myself into. I went into it pretty naively and I had this experience where I started to relive my near death experience. I kind of blacked out. I remember like walking in the woods and finding this little rock in the middle of this trail. And I said, this is where I'm going to die. 
Um, and it felt like death was coming back into my life and the whole world started to have teeth and mouths. And then it tore me into shreds. Um, and I entered into this, this void of nothingness and it was just dark, but I ended up, um, reliving my near death experience in the sense that I felt like I went somewhere. And then I had this kind of spiritual experience of having some sort of this entity type of contact, right? Like Terrence McKenna would call it like the self-transforming machine elves. It felt like something like that. But I remember going there and being like, I feel like I've been here before. And these things were like thousands of times. And I said, okay, well, if I've been here thousands of times, then this must be some sort of death bardo. Am I in the death bardo? Is this where I went when I died that one night? Um, And they said, yeah, more or less so. And I said, oh shit, okay. So I'm like sitting there trying to be logical. I'm like, if I've been here thousands of times, I'm in a death bardo then maybe this is like God, or maybe this is the thing that I talk to. Because when I came back from the near death experience, I woke up and it felt like I had this map on my chest of like, this is the way the world is. And it was this totally new way of of being in the world, which was really difficult. So having this experience really helped me to recontextualize it. And I had a really, really difficult time because it felt like I went somewhere during the near death experience, but I didn't have the whole visual aspect. And I feel like in our culture, seeing is believing. I just had this bodily felt sense that something happened really profoundly i can't remember it it was like psilocybin allowed me to remember or it allowed me to re-experience that um so i just became so fascinated I, I came back from that going how the hell could somebody ingest something that grows from the earth that could replicate death like that all over again um so I just went down some intellectual rabbit holes, um, kind of by mistake. Like the first book I read was uh, Dr. Rick Strassman's DMT, The Spirit Molecule. And I didn't pick it up because it said DMT. I picked it up because it, in, in the subtitle, it said something about near research and near-death experiences. And I was like, you know, maybe maybe I need to start reading about this. And it's weird that I didn't really kind of pick that stuff up when I was younger to kind of get an idea of like what other people were talking about. So that sent me on a whole path. Um, I ended up at this little uh, college in Vermont called Burlington College to study transpersonal psychology. So studied everything around psychedelics. I got trained in um, a breathwork technique. I, you know, it was kind of like a Hogwarts school. It was really cool. Um, very experientially oriented, um, really kind of focused on inner work, inner development. And then, um, yeah, and then Joe and I met around 2015. Um, and so I was really kind of already involved in the psychedelic space a little bit and, um, you know, meeting people at the college, I actually, um, created a capstone project where I taught a 16 week course with some of my teachers. And that was called, uh, Stan Groff's psychology of extraordinary experiences. And, and Dr. Stanislav Groff is one of the pioneers in LSD research and, uh, the, the one of the co-developers of, of holotropic breathwork with his, uh, wife, Christina's, um, deceased wife, uh, Christina Groff. And, um, so yeah, we we came together and um, yeah, I, I taught this this class there, and then they invited us back to teach another class on the history of psychedelics the following year. Um, so that's kind of really where things started to get percolated was at uh, during this this college experience and, and had the opportunity to kind of start creating curriculum around psychedelics, which was pretty cool. Yeah, I love that, and I love that uh, origin story. Um, it's it's really interesting, you know. I, I have heard something similar from a lot of other people where they have some sort of either near death experience or some sort of powerful psychedelic like experience without the use of psychedelics, and then later on in their life, when they're older or whatever, they will have a you know a psilocybin experience or something along those lines, and it'll be quite familiar, which I always thought is very interesting, right? I mean. It's it's amazing that, yeah, we could, it just adds to the mystery of the whole thing. Not only like you mentioned, it's so mysterious that this little thing that grows out of cow poop can have yeah. such profound <laughs> implications on the human mind, but also that yeah. that's able to happen without, and those things are kind of similar. Yeah, yeah. And that just made me so curious, right? And I think it left me with more questions and answers. Yeah, but I I did want to dig into the the school a little bit. So you went to school to kind of learn about what specifically did you learn about in school that kind of like helped to usher usher you into an education focus for psychedelics. 
Yeah, so the degree was in transpersonal psychology. And for those that don't know uh, what transpersonal psychology is, it's uh, transpersonal literally just means beyond the personal. So transpersonal psychology is trying to bridge that gap between like mystical experiences and trying to have some science to look at these things, these experiences and try to validate it a little bit because, right, we if we usually can't measure it, we just dismiss it. And so a lot of the curriculum that I went through um, uh, during that time was you know, I took classes of like existential psychology. We had a dream retreat where I went to our teacher's uh, house during the summer and a, a group of us would camp in, in his little field, his, his yard. And then we would do Jungian dream analysis in the morning um, and have all these like dream practices. I would get credit for um, going down and, and studying with uh, Lenny Elizabeth Gibson at Dream Shadow for breath work. So I'd go down there and, um, you know, get credit for that. And it wasn't just the experiential piece. It was also intellectual. You had to, you know, write a lot of papers and, um, you know, back it up intellectually. Um, so yeah, it was just a very kind of experientially oriented program. I was able to do a lot of self-study too. So I had the opportunity to create independent studies. So, um, sometimes that looked like, um, I remember in 2013, I put the, um, yeah, uh, uh, independent study together to go to the MAPS conference and the, the class was on psychedelic science. Um, so I ended up going to the, the uh, psychedelic science conference that MAPS put on. It's a pretty big event in 2013. I was able to get credit for that, you know, and along with like different reading materials and, and stuff like that. So, you know, it was this really interesting school where I was able to get creative and do so much stuff that was psychedelic related, but also helping to give the skills like training and breath work is a really great skill for sitting with people. Um, in these non-ordinary states um, or holotropic states. Um, so yeah, it was just this really kind of, that's why I call it kind of like Hogwarts. It just allowed me to really cultivate a lot of those skills. And, it, you know, we had to do a capstone um, at graduation. And so that's kind of like the culmination of, of your, your work uh, during the program. And so, yeah, I just got this idea of like, you know, I really want to be able to pass this stuff on more. Maybe I can create a course and a really cool, cool advisor um, that, you know, worked with me that allowed me to do that. So shout out to, to Kim Nolan for that, for supporting me in that, um, which was, so that was cool. It was like, okay, we're able to now, um, you know, educate people around psychedelics in these states through this course. And there was a new advisor that came in and they were trying to create a self-study um, master's program in transpersonal psychology. And I was just going back through like some of these early emails that we were exchanging with a whole group of people. And there was this idea that we wanted to create this emphasis in psychedelic studies too. Um, I remember we got all these flyers printed up and um, and then we wanted to train breathwork facilitators uh, through that. And then unfortunately, the school collapsed um, in 2013. Um, so it kind of just like, it felt like, oh, there's like all this really great movement and, you know, really unique program. And then it closed due to just some, uh, yeah, I guess, bad financial management and buying a, a big piece of property that they couldn't really afford. So it had nothing to do with like the academic portion, but, um, you know, and then when Joe and I got together, um, we started podcasting and then, you know, we were thinking, you know, this is great, but also, you know, we want to maybe d be doing some more like educate, educating and also thinking about like, what is the, what does the community need? Um, so, people weren't really talking. I mean, people were just starting to talk about integration, but there was no resources. So that was like our first step um, in creating some education on psychedelics today was creating a class um, called Navigating Psychedelics Lessons on Self-Care and Integration um, to really kind of just get an overview of like, how are people in the field approaching um, this topic? And nobody, like people are starting to talk about it, but there's really no resources available. Now it's like, you know, everywhere, everybody's talking about integration, which is like really, really important. Glad to, to see that. Yeah, everybody's talking about it. There's a lot more education out there, which is really cool. And, you know, education is incredibly important. But when you think about it, you know, like what the syllabus should be or what the training should be kind of brings me back to this whole idea of, you know, the idea of psychedelic training or psilocybin assisted therapy training is quite new, at least um, mm -hmm. in, in the context that we're talking about it now. Of course, historically, you know, these are roles that would be maybe taken up by shamans or other spiritual leaders. And I was kind of wondering, like, as we're introducing things like modern psilocybin therapy, specifically like models that we're seeing emerge in Oregon, 
it seems like almost we're kind of making it up as we go along. I mean, that's probably not fair uh, assessment, but it almost seems like, you know, this is new, right? And everybody's kind of well, making kinda things is, up or creating things. Degree. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is to some degree. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I do want to talk about the Synthesis Institute and everything that was going on there as well. But like in general, first I wanted to ask, you know, how do we define something like a syllabus for psilocybin assisted therapy how do we determine whether or not someone is actually qualified to do so and you know from that context is there any training needed at all it's it's kind of a messy area so i just wanted to get your thoughts on that a little bit it's really interesting right because if we're bringing in um say shamanic cultures that that may be using that it's a lifelong process you just don't go through a training program and you know um get certified and you're able to do it for that it's a life calling um and i always like to kind of come back to the work of martin practel um who is a mayan shaman <clears throat> He grew up on a Pueblo Indian reserve, found himself down in Guatemala. Um, he gets there and, and this shaman of the village is like, oh, you've come. And Martin's looking at him and going, this is the guy that's been showing up in my dreams. <laughs> um, yeah, really interesting. But, uh, you know, I, I find like uh, Martin's perspective on shamanism to be pretty interesting because, you know, he, in an interview that he did, I think it was like a, uh, in, in an article, he's like, this is a terrible job. Nobody wants it. You know, like the spirits kind of call you in your life just starts to kind of fall apart for a little bit. If anything goes wrong in the community, the community hates you or they're pointing fingers at, Oh, the shaman did this or, you know, this and that. And so it's this job of like really high responsibility and it's like really intense. And, um, if you look at the anthropological reports, um, you could say like when, uh, anthropologists are starting to study this, they all kind of notice this phenomenon called the shamanic illness or the shamanic crisis, where somebody does come to the brink of death. They get deathly ill um, and they go through this an initiatory crisis, which kind of exposes them to the other world, right? So like Martine Pactel talks about shamanism, they're kind of like these lawyers between this world and the spirit world. Um, and so when people get elected into that, they kind of have this confrontation with death or, and they get kind of exposed to that. And, you know, nobody wants to go through that. That's, that's like a terrible thing. To, so um, to think about like f for, you know, millennia, people have been called into this work either through that or, you know, sometimes it was passed down through like a family lineage, right? Maybe your father or your mother was a, um, a healer and it got passed on that way and you took on that role. But again, also times are changing too. Like we don't live in, in that type of culture anymore. And so we do have to think about like, what does this look like um, in, in modern day society? Um, but you know, it is tricky because some, like when we look at Oregon, for example, um, you know, they are requiring a 120 hour training program. In my mind, that's like nothing to some degree. And even at Vital, what we're doing, our education, like we're not training licensed facilitators. We're really just trying to train people around harm reduction, integration, and really forming a lot of those um, psychedelic competencies and literacies. People are probably going to take that and people are living in areas where, you know, these substances are decriminalized or they're, you know, taking on risks. And I, I believe people should just have education around this so they can make more informed decisions. But to become like a licensed facilitator, um, you know, it, it takes a while. And I always come back to something with my breathwork training. I didn't go and start breathwork because I wanted to become a facilitator. I got into it because I wanted to do my own personal development and I had a really profound experience with it. And I was like, I just want to keep learning about this. I like, I didn't think of it as like any sort of career path or that I was wanting to move into, like, I want to become a breathwork facilitator and offer this work. And, you know, usually we say it's around like a minimum of a two year program. Um, and I don't think I ever started really facilitating any group until like four or so years in of like, so I felt like competent enough to have that training. But it also brings up, you know, um, these questions around four year training isn't very scalable when things are trying to come to market. Oregon just passed this law and 
you know, if it takes four years to train really competent, you know, facilitators, you know, it's, it's not really going to work. Um, and then, you know, you also have to take into account, like people have been doing this in the underground for a really long time. And, you know, just because somebody didn't go through a course, does that make them, you know, not, um, you know, valuable or, or valid, even though they might have decades of, of training. Um, and then, you know, do they have to go through a course to, to get that credentialing? So, yeah, it's a lot of kind of like nuance and complexity, uh, to it that, that you know the field is trying to figure out and states are trying to figure out and there's so many different opinions around like what's ideal and like how things should form yeah i mean it, it does seem quite turbulent because the, you know there is no obvious answer for for how to do it i mean i think some people think there's some obvious answers but when you really think about it you're right. You don't, you know, you don't want to have this accelerated cycle to train people, but also it's not realistic to have these four year training cycles. Yeah. And, you know, our culture or society isn't just really built up to just like shove these models into a, a, a new paradigm and see how it works. Um, there's a, a great article I was reading that was kind of breaking down the entire, you know, synthesis institute um fallout and everything else and i'll just read right from it it says the oregon health authority used the synthesis course as a template for its psychedelic therapy program graduates would just need to take another theoretical exam and then they could be employed by psilocybin service center so this is again talking about synthesis institute they had a bunch of students and um, they're now kind of defunct so the students are kind of in the lark but it says uh, the Oregon bill presented itself as a response to the public health crisis of me mental illness. So someone without any experience in a healing profession who has done a year long online course and then taken part in a truffle ceremony could be in a position to offer psychedelic therapy to the mentally ill if they were accepted into these uh, service centers. So I, I don't know. I just thought that was like a really profound way to say it. Like, but I don't really have a good answer. Like what? Well, it's interesting know, that they're the saying right? mentally, mentally ill, because like, if you look at like Oregon law, this is really written up as an adult use context. And hopefully somebody would be screened out that way. And this mm -hmm. um, law wasn't written for say medical use. Um, and so it's funny that we are just con like, we're equating that right away. I mean, yes, there's people that are probably going to lie through screening processes and um, you know, people are using it for mental health benefit. Um, but the way the law was written, it's it's really about adult use, and so there you don't need a medical diagnosis to receive services um, in Oregon law, which is you know pretty interesting, I, I think. Um, but I mean, that is the debate, right? Like um, you have people that have medical training, they have years of psychotherapy training. I'm trained as a therapist um, and, you know, psycho like going to school for counseling, that was, I mean, you, you know, you have to do your undergrad, so that's four years. And then, you know, you have about six or seven years of training total. My, my, I ended up doing like a three-year program, uh, just kind of spreading stuff out part-time. Um, but, you know, I did an online counseling program and some of that was all online. Um, and we didn't have the only hands-on stuff was the practicum, which was great. Right. And that's, I think where a lot of the learning happens. And that was 700 hours of practicum time of doing psychotherapy, um, under supervision. And then plus after you, you know, graduate and you get your associate license you, in the state of New Jersey, you have to do 4,500 hours of supervision. Um, and I mean, it would be cool to see stuff like that pop up of like having supervision once people graduate. So it's like you can get your educational requirement, but now you're practicing and you have mentorship, you have supervision, you're getting that hands-on exposure and hopefully service centers and companies provide that to their facilitators when they, once they kind of enter into the job market. Um, and, you know, I know some people were like, well, ex exactly. Like it took about seven years to become a therapist longer. If you include um, supervision it takes how many years to be a doctor. Um, but, we're also dealing with this totally new market where market demand is like going to, you know, there, there's that market demand versus like there's already, you know, trained physicians, therapists, that market already exists. So you can kind of have that buffer time to train people. Right. You know, you have this new law that passed and it's like, we need to bring this to market. People are, are, are wanting this service. So yeah, it is that like kind of really interesting, um, conundrum of like what's best here and how do we do this ethically and safe because there is going to be 
fallout. There's going to be harm mm -hmm. done. People are going to have difficult experiences. There probably aren't going to be enough like integration supports. Um, the current, I think just the system in general isn't very supportive of psychedelics. So I always come back to, to that um, where it's like, you know, how's the system catching people too after really difficult experiences? And, you know, we, we need to think about that than just building kind of like the, the psychotherapy or whatever that model is and on drug develop on drug um, or like, yeah providing those substances or medicines yeah and i guess you just hope that somewhere along the lines we don't forget about how powerful and amazing these substances really can be because i think a lot of times it gets caught up in you know a lot of the debate and a lot of the turbulence and how things are changing so fast and um i think that's probably why people are so that you know there seems to be so much tension in the space right now because because people realize what they have right this is this amazing special thing it's kind of re-emerging um as an amazing special thing and we didn't make sure that we properly usher it <laughs> and and give it the, the respect it needs and 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 what it needs to to thrive and have a positive impact on society as a whole which i think you know is the the most likely outcome here would you agree that you know this is the most likely outcome is that this is going to be a very positive thing for society in general I think so. Yeah. You know, I think um, what these substances can offer, I mean, it's going to be kind of a little disruptive maybe to society. Um, but I think overall, um, the benefits sometimes outweigh the risks, right? Like we do need to change culturally. Um, and, uh, you know, I think having these medicines in our toolkit can really help with that. You know, we, we, knew, we need new ways of thinking. We need, um, you know, kind of new ways of being in the world. And, but, you know, they're not going to save us, right? So I, I always think about the pandemic, for example, really destabilizing for everybody, right? And then we all kind of went through this crisis together and we're like, you know, okay, let's close down the streets. We all need to like eat outside. And, you know, you saw communities come together and it's like, oh, now there's, um, you know, outdoor eateries and people are like, you know, interacting a little bit more. Um, and now it's like the world, well, let's get back to normal. And uh, all those places are closed down. You have cars driving on the streets again. And it's like, so we're dealing with something similar where it's like you get a glimpse of like, oh, things could be different, right? Like where I live, it's like you couldn't get plants. Like everybody started picking up gardening. They started picking up like home improvement stuff because we didn't have anything to do. Um, and people seem to enjoy that to some degree. You know, I know it was kind of like crazy of like you're just kind of stuck and you needed to do things to fill your time. But, you know, it was like we got exposed to a new way of being for for a year or so. Um and now it's just back to the normalness, right? And so we're going to be dealing with the same thing with psychedelics where you get exposed to new ideas, new experiences. But now we got to deal with, you know, the culture and the systems that we're in. So, um, you know, I think overall, like for people to explore who they are with psychedelics or breath work or whatever kind of techniques, I think that's overall good. And it's going to be slow change um, over time. Right. And what do you think some of those changes are going to be, though? Like if you could, you know, if you had a crystal ball, what, what would you think <laughs> the next three to five years are going to reveal for psilocybin therapy or, you know, psilocybin in general in, in the U.S.? Like it seems like things are changing very fast. I know in Canada, for example, things are also changing very fast. You can go to Vancouver and there's like, you know, well-branded open dispensaries where people can just go and get mushrooms. In Alberta, psychiatrists are starting to work with psilocybin. Um, what are your predictions or, you know, if you could interpolate the last couple of years, what do you think it's going to be like in say three to five years from now? I mean, if you asked me this three or five years ago, I probably wouldn't think like this much progress would have happened. So I have no idea how fast the progress is going to either go or, you know, we'll, we'll kind of go back. But with that in mind, um, I think there will be more local ordinances passing um, for decriminalization. We already are seeing so many bills that are kind of... Um, uh, getting put forward. Um, and you know, I forget how many states are looking at different uh, bills and initiatives um, for something that's kind of mimicking stuff like Oregon or even just putting a task force together to do research. So I know like Connecticut has a bill that's trying to put a, a task force together uh, to, um, you know, even just 
think about like if this is the future can we start researching it um vermont has like four different bills um that are that just got proposed um all kind of different from like uh reducing the criminalization of it taking it off their kind of scheduled list um to yeah kind of uh legalization um, you know, we did just see Colorado pass something that was similar to Oregon, um, and I think a little bit more flexible. I haven't read the laws in, in, in a while, but, you know, I know that they legalize uh, psilocybin for kind of like uh, these service type centers, um, but they've also decriminalized other medicines like uh, DMT and, and different um, mescaline containing cacti. So I think more states will probably um, take that on and, um, you know, it might take a while, but I think even if the conversation is happening and those bills are being proposed, that's a good thing. And more people will probably start fighting for the decriminalization. I mean, I don't know, I forget how many decriminalized cities and towns there are now, but I mean, that's more than I would ever you know, think like five years ago, right? So I think that's gonna continue to happen. And it's starting to become a bipartisan issue, right? So a lot of uh, vets are starting to speak out, you know, first responders, people that have really benefited um, from these medicines. And so you're starting to see that like Texas passed a bill for uh, vets to get, be able to get access to like psilocybin through research. I mean, it's a small step, but it's also a big step too, right? So you're starting to see more parties come together and agree on this than disagree at times. I mean, there's always gonna, we're, we're also battling errors of the drug war and the harm and the taboo and the stigma, stigmatizing these substances. So that's always gonna be what we're fighting against. And so, um, but I think with the internet and the massive amount of information that's out there nowadays and uh, people sharing their stories it's really hard to ignore so as like a mental health worker for example um to have something in my toolkit that could really help somebody how could i ignore the research there right um and it's like we need new advancements um, in psychiatry and mental health and then just thinking about um yeah just the overall kind of effect of, of psychedelics so people sharing their stories and continuing to share their stories is really gonna i think impact people and resonate you know the fear of that is you know people are gonna have these like um big experiences they're gonna have the quote unquote bad trip people are gonna say see that's what we were all warned about um but you know we can also mitigate that through you know education really focusing on integration and allowing people to you know not make the kind of newbie mistakes that maybe we've all made <laughs> in the past um you know i think we we have this opportunity where people can be, become more informed around how how they're they're taking this so yeah i see kind of more states going that way more kind of clinic service centers uh, popping up um we're gonna see more kind of biotech plays i know the biotech industry is probably not doing so hot right now um but that will uh take over maps is um you know headed to legalize mdma i think by 2024 so coming up pretty soon we'll see um at least mdma there we'll also see um Compass Pathways and uh, a couple of those other organizations bringing psilocybin through FDA approval, same as what MAPS is doing with MDMA. Um, so I'm hopeful that we'll have this diverse um, ecosystem where places like Oregon, you can take it in that adult use model, go for your own kind of self-discovery, maybe you're doing it for spiritual reasons. And then for the people that really, really need one-on-one -on -one support um maybe outside of a group context and they really need a trained clinician doctor there you know the fda route will be there and and hopefully some of that will be covered by insurance so i mean that's the other kind of um elephant in the room is you know make bringing it down the medical route is like it makes it just so inaccessible to a lot of people um you know i i worked with ketamine for um a little bit in, in my practice um before I, I paused my clinical practice um and ketamine is pretty cheap um you know it, it's not that expensive but it's the resources of spending time with a therapist for two hours so now you're using psilocybin with a therapist and if you're doing the dual therapist thing so now you're paying two therapists for close to six hours or eight hours, right? It, it, it makes it very expensive. So I'm hoping that we'll see like uh, insurance reimbursements and insurance covering these types of therapies as well. Yeah, I agree that that's definitely something to think about. I mean, you mentioned ketamine, um, you know, talking again about some of these uh, companies that are having financial issues. There's, you know, the ketamine clinics that are shutting down all over the place. 
um, just because it's not that financially reasonable to do because like you mentioned, the ketamine itself is inexpensive, but the actual treatment, the resources, the people, that is quite expensive. And, you know, it doesn't really seem to work as a business model, at least not now. Yet, you know, those same business models are kind of being proposed for psilocybin therapy. So it kind of brings back the bigger question, like, are there any viable models that are going to work in terms of a business model? Um, and if not, like, what are what are some of these options? I'm really like kind of hopeful for like more community led <clears throat> type of group process. I mean, I think group work is going to be big um, in the future where people are, are able to come together in a group that does cut down the costs for a lot. I think individual kind of one on one work is I th- again, I'm hoping like insurance will cover that for people that really, really need it because some people with pretty significant trauma you know, it's really hard for them to to let go in a group. And then plus the, the amount of attention somebody may need, you can't get that in a group. Um, so I'm hoping that, again, more states kind of go along this model with Oregon that allows a little bit more diversity in the field, even though, again, like it is kind of controversy at times, like, you know, the medical professionals, like, you know, are like, ah, oh, you know, people, you know, don't have adequate training. But we have to remember these substances have been part of human culture for a very long time. Um, and the group model also, I think, is somewhat new too, right? So say if we looked at like ayahuasca shamanism, um, you know, typically it was a shaman that would ingest a substance on behalf of the client. And so that's also something really interesting to think about that like before the shaman would really engage with that medicine, even, even with psilocybin. Um, and then um, yeah, now, now more and more people are, are starting to ingest and have their own experiences. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just really hopeful around group models. Um, and you know, a lot of also the healing happens in community, right? We are a culture that is just so isolated. Um, and I know there's been a lot of studies on loneliness and isolation, especially since the pandemic and just how like this nuclear family system works in America and Western culture. It's like, you know, we don't have community. I think there's something really special around these medicines and trying to bring community together. And so I, I'm really hope I'm hopeful that that will continue to happen as some of these community models um, that, that will make it accessible. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because I totally feel that where, you know, there's a lot less community, but at the same time, you know, there's a lot of online communities and it allows us to totally. do things like this. And, uh, yeah. but it's, it's just not, not quite the same, but you, you do get to connect with people all over the world and it really speeds up this whole process of integration in a way, um, or speeds up the process of learning and education in a way as well. Um, I wanted to harken back to another point though, you mentioned about, this idea of group therapy uh two things there do you think one it's important or reasonable for like psilocybin therapists to also be uh, under the influence of psilocybin during these therapy sessions and number two do you think if not that then it's important for them to at least have had an experience in the past or do you think it has no relevance at all I definitely think it's important to have your own experience um, and, you know, it helps to provide a little bit of context around what could be going on for somebody. With that said, you know, what if somebody can't ingest, I mean, psilocybin is, you know, we, we all know, like, physiologically, it's relatively safe. Um, and, you know, there may be like some conditions where what if somebody couldn't get couldn't take psilocybin because of a medical issue, right? Like, but they had tons of experience with like, say, breathwork training. You know, I think I would really trust a breathwork facilitator um, to, to do that work. Um, yeah, they may be missing out on like some core components of like, um, y- you know, like what the experience could be like, because they are completely kind of different at times. Um, but, you know, I think, w- you know, with some exceptions like that, where somebody maybe can't take it right so thinking about accessibility did you just cut somebody off completely because something medical could come up and they, they can't they can't take it but they're a really good healer right like they just have that like healer archetype they know how to hold space like um and and they can you know be there for somebody um but with that said i, I do think it's important to have your own experience and continue to do your own work so you're familiar with the space and like you kind of know how to navigate it because i think being a good facilitator and, you know, this may depend on the context and, and I'll get to your point around ingesting. So 
from our context um, is what we really try to um, uh, educate and train people is, is this kind of like Grafian style approach that we learned through breath work. And it's really focused on this inner directive approach. So really hands off, like we're not trying to heal anybody. Like we're just trying to create a container and allow somebody to go through their own healing process. And, you know, there might be some intervention that happens, but really it's like, as a facilitator of that, I go, why do I want to step in right now and do X, Y, and Z? right? Oh, I'm feeling anxious and I feel like I need to help this person, right? So a lot of it is doing your own kind of self-reflection and becoming self-aware of like, maybe I shouldn't do this right now, right? Because what we think is good for somebody actually may not be good for somebody. And just to give an example, at a, um, a workshop um, doing breath work, uh, a sitter is like, oh, somebody, you know, a person's foot is exposed. Let me just put their blanket on them or cover them up. During the group share, we found out that that triggered this person. Why, you know, it was like, why did you put this like blanket all over me? Like, you know, and it brought up all these kind of biographical things uh, that they dealt with in, in their past. Um, and so, you know, we don't always know what's going on with people. And then from the shamanic perspective, like, you know, I can see why people would ingest a substance. If we look at ayahuasca ceremonies, right? The shaman may have a very long relationship with ayahuasca. They have that training. They've been drinking ayahuasca every day you know for x amount of years they know how to hold that group container with that medicine and again you know if we look at some traditional use of um, plant medicines in in that container the shaman would go in and uh you know go into that that spirit world and figure out what's wrong with the person and then do the healing work for them so you know, I, I do understand why people would want to ingest, right? Some facilitators say, I feel like I'm more in tune. I feel like I can like read the energy more. I feel like I can like show up and do, do some healing work a little bit more. Um, and I think that's okay, but we just have to like really provide context around like how this is happening um, for those group participants so they know what they're signing up for um, ahead of time. You know, the, the, the worry I think for a lot of folks is, you know, uh, people getting too high as a facilitator. It, I think it's really important to have a grounding rod, um, somebody to make executive decisions. Um, like I've been in group containers where facilitators are ingesting and some just like they're totally in that other world and executive decisions need to happen. And sometimes it just like isn't happening because they're they're kind of off doing something else. And so you know, yeah, it comes back to context. And then, you know, if you have a facilitator that isn't, say, has a deep relationship with the medicine and can't hold space for that, you always come back to, well, whose trip is it? Is it the facilitator's trip or is it the individual's trip? And so I think when it comes to that, like people need like a lot of experience and training to do that. And to think like, are you showing up as a shaman and trying to heal somebody? Or are you trying to show up to create a group, group container for the person and the individual to heal themselves? Um, yeah, because I mean, even in, the, you know, outside of the context of therapy, you know, there's always been this idea of a trip sitter, or I like what you call the grounding rod. And I think that does make a lot of sense. And, you know, I have talked to other therapists before about this. And their idea was that, you know, the mushrooms are doing the work, you're doing the work and mushrooms have this amazing ability to I, I don't know how they do it. we kind of talked about this at the top, but like this amazing ability to figure out whatever it is that you might need to deal with. They have amazing ability to yeah. dig out trauma that you maybe have never even thought of before. And the mushrooms are really doing that work. You're doing the work in terms yeah. of the healing and the facilitator or the sitter or whatever you want to call it is there to just kind of, you know, help create a safe space, make you feel comfortable and, you know, not necessarily, you know, um, ch change the experience or guide the experience in that way. Is that kind of how you see it as well? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, now, I, I want to switch gears a little bit and just have uh, a couple couple fun kind of random questions. Um, cool. First one is, you know, if you could have a conversation like this with any kind of historical figure in psychedelics, who would that be? Who's on your list? Who? Um... <laughs> You know, somebody asked me like who I'd want to trip with. And, um, you know, I think one person that I really wanted to have a conversation with and have a podcast with that we didn't get to do was uh, Ralph Metzner. 
Um, he was just kind of like a big inspiration to me during my undergrad. And um, I, I really appreciated his work. And I got to meet him a few times. Um, but, you know, I really wish I, I got to sit down to, to do a conversation like this with him. Um, and, yeah, he passed a few years ago. But, yeah, I really wish I was able to do that with him. What is one of the most surprising or unexpected things that you've learned over the years from your work in this field? <laughs> Oh man, things are constantly changing. Um, and just be ready for, for anything. It, it is a ride. Um, so, but I guess personally, like kind of diving into this work, um, always just stay curious. Like we don't know. Um, and I think that's a really hard thing to, to really kind of come up against. So something I'm always reminding people is, you know, if you want to get involved in psychedelics, be a little comfortable with uncertainty. Um, we just don't know. Um, and how do we really hold that and be curious a little bit more because things are constantly changing. And, you know, if anybody's really been there in the depths of, of a psychedelic experience, you kind of know, you don't have anything to really grip onto. Um, it's, it's always in flux, right? <laughs> yeah. And these things are very much so ineffable and, and hard to explain. So, yeah. um, I guess you're right. You know, there's new, new things to learn, uh, at every turn, <laughs> Um, yeah, if there's yeah. like something you could, you could tell everybody, if you could put out a billboard or you could put on, you know, you could go on national TV right now and tell the world, what is something that you want people <laughs> to know about mushrooms or maybe even about psychedelics in general, but specifically about psilocybin mushrooms? Hopefully they can save the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, they can help to deepen your relationship with yourself, um, and the world around you. And I think we kind of need that to deepen the relationship with the world around us a little bit more. Um, and we just had, um, Dr. Sam Gandy on with our, our vital programming. And he, uh, talked about nature connectedness and how psilocybin was at the top of the list for getting people connected more with nature. Um, and the fact that, you know, we are dealing with a lot of kind of chaos in the world and a disconnection from nature. Um, and this is, you know, um, as Bucky Fuller would say, spaceship earth, we need to take care of it. And I think psilocybin has the ability to help us reconnect with the world. Um, and I think we desperately need that right now. Yeah. And uh, on a grander scale, I, I agree with you. And also at a personal scale, like mushrooms have this amazing ability to maybe help you kind of think about different priorities, put things yep. in line. And again, I don't know how they do it, but they somehow do it in some amazing, miraculous way. Kyle, if people wanted to learn more about you or about psychedelics today or the work that you're doing there, where would they go to find that? Yeah, you can just check us out at uh, psychedelicstoday.com. Um, you can check us out on any podcast platforms, so just Psychedelics Today, any social media. Um, and then if you want to learn more about our training opportunities, you can check that out at vitalpsychedelictraining.com. Um, and then if you want to follow me personally, um, I have a, you can find me at settingsunwellness.com um, or um, <clears throat> find me on social medias under that or just my name, Kyle Buller. All really great stuff. Yeah, Psychedelics Today is a ton of great information, ton of great education. You guys have been doing it for a very long time. So I think all of us in even the mushroom community owe you guys a debt of gratitude for putting out so much amazing content over the years. We will put all the links in the description of this video or in the show notes if you're listening to it on a podcast. But Kyle, thank you so much for joining us today on The Mushroom Show. I think that was a really great conversation. Yeah, thank you, Tony. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Again, they are great educators in this space and have been around for a long time. I'm sure if you're watching the show, you've definitely heard of Psychedelics today, but either way, I will put the link in the description so you can go ahead and check it all out. On that note, I'll be signing off from the show. Again, thank you so much for watching. If you like mushrooms, if you like the mushroom show, it would mean the world to me if you go ahead and hit that like button if you haven't done that already. Also, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. It's just awesome to be able to come on here every couple of weeks and chat mushrooms with you. In the meantime, though, if you want to also follow me at FreshCapTony on Twitter, spend a lot of time there doing research for the show and just interacting with the mushroom community, and I would love to see you there. So thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next episode.